to record just one, two. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. Today we will be discussing empathy and inclusivity of people with HIV AIDS. We have our blog today to talk about how COVID-19 affected them and how they struggle mentally with this condition. According to Malaysian Health uh, Ministry reports, people who live with HIV were estimated to be 87,000 in 2019. So we would like to know more about people with this condition and how to they cope with it mentally. Um, welcome, Dr. Bumilia. Thank um, you, Mina. <laughs> Thank you, and Diane as well. Thank you. Before we proceed, can you please introduce yourself and give us a um, short um, information about your background? Sure. Um, I am, uh, a lot of people talk, call me Miss Pam as well. Uh, I'm a lecturer. I'm also a clinical psychologist. And at present, I am the coordinator of Psychology Services Unit, PSU, in the Department of Psychology. I'm also the coordinator of IIUM Mental Health and Psychosocial Care Team, which is also called IMPACT, and that's under the CULIA. And yes, so that's a little bit about me, and I enjoy helping staff and students through what they're going through, especially during COVID-19. I also completed my PhD recently. In um, The title was The Development and Evaluation of an Intervention Program for Adolescents Living with HIV AIDS in Malaysia. So that was um, it was a very meaningful intervention program and a wonderful research that I really enjoyed doing. And at the moment, I am still trying to be in contact with them and trying to find a suitable time and way that we can actually continue uh, kind of like, you know, sustaining our program with them, despite my PhD being finished. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Winting will be asking the first question. Okay, uh, the, our, the first question is, uh, what uh, motivated you to help people with HIV and uh, AIDS? Okay, so um, what actually motivated me to help people with HIV and AIDS is actually that I always, from small, I feel like I have the passion to help people who are stigmatized and people who are discriminated and people who are, you know, ostracized or left alone or really... Um, you can say like people who are actually being, uh, you know, unfairly treated. And I always have that passion from small. I remember when I was younger, I always would look for the girl who's like sitting alone in class and I would try to be friends with her. So I have that kind of passion in me. So when I see, um, when I, I actually met these kids once, when I went to do my master's thesis research actually, and I was interviewing the women there in that home and they have HIV and they, are, they didn't get it... Um, from birth, they actually contracted it. One of it got it got it from her husband. Another got it from, um, you know, mingling with others. You know, so with a, with another man. So what happened was, I can see how they have suffered so much and discriminated. And I can see that there. That was where I actually met these kids there. And I can and they got it perinatally, which means that they were born with a disease because of mother to child transfusion transmission. And when I saw all that, I really felt like I can see how much they are suffering emotionally, socially, behaviorally. They don't even know that uh, why are they taking this medication? What is it for? How is the gravity of the situation, that, you know, the seriousness of the disease that they have? And when I saw that, I, I became, I think that really motivated me a lot for that. Yeah. No, okay, great. Um, what actually, um, how long have you been working with people with HIV AIDS? Um, it's about, I would say since 2011, that was when I started working with adolescents with, uh, and also people with HIV, HIV AIDS, because also in 2011, it was with the women. And then after that, in 2013, it was more with the kids, uh, which who now are youths already. They were adolescents. So I watched them grow from like eight to 16 years old. It's like about eight years, nine years, I watched them grow. So I've been working with them for really quite a long time, watching them from primary school to now secondary school. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so people, uh, people with the HIV or the ADS uh, have been the uh, ostracized. Uh, um, 
sorry, Austro, uh, have been ostracized uh, about the crowding to report or refer to the news reports. Uh, has this changed uh, at uh, present? At the moment, I feel that it's um, it's pretty similar. Sometimes there has been a lot of improvements, definitely. For example, there has been an increase in awareness on HIV AIDS. Uh, although the stigma and discrimination still exists, in you know in whether in Malaysia or in other countries, but there definitely has been an increase in awareness. People are more aware now that not everyone can actually get um, you know contract the virus in just by by meeting with each other just by handshakes so people are very aware that the virus is not contractible in a very easy way so i think the awareness has actually increased right now and however there is still um you know they still feel ostracized because the fear of society the fear of their future will they actually live a normal life one of them even shared with me we cannot have normal jobs actually because people don't give us so we just have to find a job within the shelter or within here so they really have a very bleak idea of what their future would look like and it's very sad to see that and and it's because and it doesn't come out of nowhere because these are teenagers right how did they learn that they must have heard somewhere they must have seen somewhere so i think that although the awareness is increasing there is a need for it to still increase even more because they are so afraid of being accepted by society. Starting a family, because they are aware that they have to be very careful about their status. So having a relationship with someone who is negative, you know, not, not HIV positive, is also a risk. And they, they are given a lot of courses on marriage courses, how to go about that. And also, um, they really feel that, you know, I, I interviewed one of the adolescents he's one of the uh, older ones right and he said that this awareness uh, of being ostracized and all that this has to start from early child education level it has to start from primary school to educate the kids there because if it starts too late that's already too late people already are ingrained and already conditioned in their mind they are already been set in their mind to stigmatize this population so it has to start at an early age and we also have to give awareness to parents as well so that they can also tell their kids because the fear still exists and there's a denial there some some might still have fear but they deny so they still stigmatize there's a lack of awareness of the dangers they do not realize that it is not going to harm you to actually have a conversation with someone with hiv it's not going to harm you to sit down and have lunch with someone with hiv you know you just take care of yourself they take care of themselves just as long as there's no um transmission of blood you know happening it should be safe in that sense so i i always eat with these kids you know like we all order our food at restaurants and everything and we all take care of our own self and they take care as well so sometimes there is also um you know this ostracizing thing right it's like some of them do not realize that a lot of these people are actually born that way you know they some of them they contract it through mother child transmission so some of these kids in the shelter home one of their main issues were especially in the boys home because i have i went to the the girls home and also the boys home the boys home when they were children people would feel pity for them because they know that they contracted it perinatally but when they become teenagers and 18 years old 19 years old society tends to look at them like they must be doing drugs they must be practicing free sex that's how they got it they deserve it some of the society actually looks at them in that way sadly they have told us they have told me that so they feel like it's very difficult for them as they're growing up because people don't think that what if they contracted it from their mom so they are feeling so ostracized sometimes and you know they feel like um very discriminated yeah Oh, okay. Uh, before I proceed with our next question, I would like to apologize. My camera is not working. Um, be, um, I would follow a question, the same question that Winting asked. Um, I have read about that in this um, website called Ajaivi Government about how the, um, you know, people's fear, as you said, is irrational doesn't come from a place of like having good information and being uh, informed. It's basically irrational fear. Is that true? 
I wouldn't uh, generalize, I guess, to say all of them are having that irrational fear. But I would say that um, it, some of it is definitely yeah, quite irrational, I think. Like, for example, if someone doesn't even want to come near to somebody who has HIV, that would be irrational. You know, like just talking to them, they, they feel afraid. You know what I mean? Like that kind of discrimination definitely would be irrational. Um, because the funny thing is, uh, just to let you guys know, actually, COVID-19 can spread faster um, than HIV AIDS. Because HIV AIDS doesn't transmit by just talking and by the air in that way, you know? So, but even so, even if somebody does have COVID-19, we should not discriminate them. How much more also if someone has, you know, HIV AIDS? So I would say that in all aspects, whatever that we do, it's good for us to really know how to take care of ourselves. If it's COVID-19, there are different kinds of measures to take care of, of course. That's a totally different ballgame. But if it's HIV, we can know that um, the level of safeness to be around someone, it's not as um, you know contractable as other diseases that are very contagious, like TB or, for example. So this is not as contractable as that. So I would say that some of the expectations or fears a little bit irrational, but it's a very good homework that like you did, by the way, Huda, checking out that um, the current fears on the on the latest website. Yeah, that's a very good discovery. Okay. Um, how does this condition affect them mentally? To what extent do they suffer mentally? You know, it's a, that's a very interesting question because you'll be surprised that there's something called the blood brain barrier so it says that why is it that because there are many research that has been done on this population and they found that why is it that a lot of kids that have hiv not all of course we cannot generalize but a large amount of them seem to be having behavioral and conduct problems in school and also at home and they found that there's something called the blood brain barrier whereby the virus can actually affect their mental functioning, their neurological functioning as well to some extent. So that could be taking a toll on their behavior and conduct. It might be having a direct connection as well. So when we look at that in that way, neurologically and physiologically, we can see that. But if you're saying mentally as in their mind, then I would say like a lot of psychological factors have an impact mentally. So the frustration, especially the thoughts of questioning, why me? Why did I have to be born that way? Why did this have to happen to me? Why did I have to contract the virus? You'll be surprised. There's even, um, there are even two siblings there. I remember there are a lot of siblings, by the way, in these homes. They come together. They have been abandoned at the hospital sometimes and some of them were abandoned at the age of two or three or some of them the mom was uh, arrested because of drugs and drug abuse and so the kids were taken in the home and the siblings came together sometimes right you will be surprised one does not have hiv one has and the one that does not have might be a carrier and so sometimes the sibling that has hiv is like why did i have why did i get it how come she doesn't have it why did I have to have it? And then I have to be on medication. She does not. So you'll be surprised with all these questions. Can you imagine what that does to a eight-year-old or nine-year-old, 10-year-old? So now that they're growing up, they're starting to think. When they were younger, they just follow what the caregiver gives them. Okay, I must take this medication at this time. Okay, now they are, they are very intellectual human beings and they're starting to think, why? But why? And if, if I have it, then why not my sister? So they start to think about all kinds of things. The thoughts about how long they have left also also scares them. The thoughts that if this is how my life is going to be all the time with medication, then why bother taking it? Because I don't think I have much time anyway. So And I feel fine. I look fine. I feel strong. They go to the gym, some of them. They're just like any other regular youth, you know, want to take care of their body, you know, very body conscious and wanting to look good. And then they feel like, I'm strong. I feel fine. I don't have to take medication. So mentally, there's also, although they have been given the awareness, but the digestion and the complete understanding of the gravity of the situation might be still lacking and in need. So they do feel, you have some of them in the spectrum where they feel like, um, how much do I have left? Is it really worth it? I'm just going to not take medication and just live. The thing that they don't realize is, even HIV has levels. 
just like cancer, it got stage cancer. They call it stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. HIV, they call it line one, line two, line three, line four. If you're in line, if a person is in line one, they can still take medication, you know, and we can avoid going to line two, line three. But if a person does not take medication from line one, it's very fast. You know, they can go to line four actually, and that is when a person can become bedridden sometimes. And it's AIDS. You know, it becomes like very dangerous at that time. Even a simple flu or diarrhea can be very fatal for them. Some in some cases, but I would say, right, there's the other side of the spectrum as well. There's also those who are very grateful, who are very aware, take the medication, very grateful. They praise God. They feel blessed every year that they are given. So we have both sides of the spectrum as well. Okay, <clears throat> this is really excellent. <laughs> um, so, the, um, what what are the challenge uh, challenges challenges to they face in their daily life? Okay, so the challenges that they face, right? Ironically, it's more dangerous for them to be around us than for us to be around them, because. You know what? Where, where every time I go and visit the shelter home, because I've been going for years, right? So they don't do that anymore to me. But before that, every time before I go and、uh, to the shelter homes, right, with about adolescents with HIV and also women with HIV, they will always remind me: if you have a flu, please do not come. If you have a cough, please do not come. Please avoid coming if you are unwell. Please make sure that those who you bring with you, because sometimes I bring my friend as a volunteer to help me as well. Please make sure that those who you bring with you also are well,、um, because a sore throat or a flu, a simple flu, not COVID nineteen, simple one, can be fatal for them. If we if we take、um, a few days to recover from a sore throat,、huh? for them, it can be a normal period is two weeks usually. I saw one of the girls having a sore throat, and she was just lying down on the couch. The whole time, of of course, a regular person also, if they're having flu, they just want to lie down. But it was so sad to see her. You know, like she was going through that for about two weeks, and suffering like that. It's just it's a flu, and she took a longer time because, as the virus name, human immunodeficiency virus. So their immune system is the one being attacked here. It's it's very low. It makes them very dangerous to be around people who have a stomach flu. You know, stomach flu, right? Where the bacteria in the stomach is the one causing the flu. So that one is very dangerous as well because that's bacterial some more.、Uh, people who have diarrhea. So one of the boy's mother, the mother was not living with him. He was he used to live with her, but she couldn't afford to take care of him. But they would keep in touch, you know. So he was in the shelter home, and the mother also has HIV. She used to be in the shelter home. And then she wanted to work outside. She wanted to have a life, so she came out of the shelter home and she worked outside as a janitor. Then, when the people found out that she has HIV, they fired her. Anyway, what happened in the end was, she contracted this. I think it was like a stomach flu. She had a terrible diarrhea. She passed away from that diarrhea. I think the diarrhea was too chronic already,、uh, and nonstop. She passed away from that. Her her cause of death was not HIV. It was. Diarrhea, because of the low immune system and everything, right? All together can cause that. So it's very sad to see how that can happen.、Um, another challenge that they face is okay. I there's one teenager that we we found that actually,、um, you know how youths actually they actually like um they they have free mixing. Am I right? So. So by the way, just to keep this,、um, it's good if you guys just like you know this this particular story you can keep just between <laughs> between us, yeah. But this the story is quite sad and also quite a private story. But I'm just sharing with you that another challenge that they faced, yeah, was there was um one girl that actually、uh, was freely mixing with her friends, accidentally, yeah, she happened to take a cocktail drink, a drink. I think she did not know what was mixed inside. When she took the drink, right, it was already spiked. Um, by her friends, and she took this drink, and then it had some kind of drug which was very strong. Now for her friends, they just got high and happy, extra happy, you know that kind of high feeling. But for her, she didn't feel good. She went to the toilet. All of a sudden, that was it. She passed away just like that, in the toilet. 
this was one of the girls that I met actually. And it was very sad because what happened was in the postmortem, her lungs had filled with water. Somehow it had that kind of a reaction on her. She had pneumonia instantly and passed away. So you see the challenge that they face, right? If we have to be careful, like now COVID-19, right? We all have to be careful. But for them, the level of carefulness is extreme. They have to take extra measures, like extra precaution. They can't afford to get this. I mean, it's like as much as they can avoid, they have to avoid, you know, because you see how the different reaction to a regular person who does not have HIV and, and the person who has, you see how that drug was too strong. She, didn't, she probably didn't even know the drink had it. And she was gone, just like that. So the challenge is, right, they have to take extra precaution, extra, extra. It's like they really have to be very, very careful. They also need to be very careful of having a life partner. Like, um, for example, now they are growing bigger. They want to get married, of course. So can they actually man marry somebody who is HIV negative? I used to think that, you know, they only can marry someone who is positive, just like them. But I heard recently from the caregivers of the home that they have certain programs that they put them in into there are certain kind of marriage courses i didn't attend that one you know it was very interesting they said that there is a way they can marry someone who's negative but there are so many things that they have to take care of and i don't know how that would work you know but i i think there's ways that they are educating them so but then very interesting uh, before getting married they have to go for that you know some in some some faiths and also some cultures they have to go for a test for hiv which i think is good as well they actually have to go for a HIV test before getting married. So at least uh, everything is out on the open, you know, it's very transparent. And another challenge that they face is they cannot afford to miss their medication at the exact time that they have been prescribed. If their medication is twice a day, if they are in the line, let's say they're line two, you know, the, um, they call it CD4 and all this kind of stuff. So if let's say the they call it viral load, viral load means the amount of virus in their body. If that is very high, they have to take uh, medication maybe twice a day. So it's say, for example, the doctor says 7 a.m., 7 p.m. I have said that for you, not a minute later. So they have to take it by, by the time. They have to put in their phone, you know, and, and instantly take it. If they miss, it... If the virus is just replicating, it's very dangerous. The The maximum amount of time that they can miss, right, to, to delay is half an hour. They can't delay more than half an hour. So every 12 hours, they have to take it. So if they delay at 7.30, uh, that's really not good already. It will show up in their report. After three months or after one month, it will show up the viral the virus amount, the viral load. It will show up so the, doc the doctor will get angry and like what is this you know this have you been taking it have you been taking it on time and everything so because somebody was taking it on time the viral load will get lesser and lesser so you see the challenge that they face all these kind of things are some of the things that they are going through oh that's really sad they may be really yeah. really strong to go through yes. all of that and still live you know exactly. um so as you mentioned the um, society has still some sort of stigma to be around them to even accept them um what is your advice to society to be more empathetic to people with that kind of condition okay i think what i would say to society is to be more empathetic with people with hiv aids is try to put your uh, themselves in their shoes that's one of the best um, the best ways to be empathetic, right? Really imagine yourself in their shoes. What if that were your fate? You are so blessed that that wasn't the journey that was written for you. What if that was the journey that was written for you? How would you feel? And how would you want others to treat you? So put yourself in their shoes. And then to have unconditional love. And positive regard and this is a very nice thing in um that we learn in psychology you know there's this humanitarian this is one of a humanistic approach in psychology um he's his name is carl rogers he's a psychologist and he talks about having three main concepts that's unconditional love or unconditional positive regard there's empathy and there's genuineness so it's a good thing that you mentioned empathy without so actually um having these three means 
unconditional love or unconditional positive regard means you love the person regardless of what disease they have. You don't look down on them for that. Just like whether it's TB, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's HIV, everything, we don't stigmatize them. They are they also are feeling so sad and wish that it never happened to them. What if it was us? We are so blessed that it's not us. Now, the second one, genuineness. Be genuine with them. If you are afraid, you know, to say, for example, you don't feel good, like, uh, swim in the same swimming pool as them. Let's say, for example, you know, it's okay to be afraid as well. I would also say society is not completely wrong as well. It's okay to be afraid as well because we are we're concerned about some things. I got a friend last time. She actually had um, a very big, uh, you can call it pimple, but... Is it a cyst? I'm not sure, but it was like a pimple, you know, it was very, very big one. The, the kind that you need doctor to help you out <laughs> with that, taking out the pus. So she had that. Then she loves to go swimming. There was once she went swimming and then, <laughs> and then, you know, um, the thing kind of like burst. Okay, so <laughs> I'm sorry for the story. But anyway, um, what happened was she was, I told her, hey, this looks like a nice swimming pool. The kids were actually asking me, whether they can actually come into the swimming club, you know, because do you think that it'll be a good idea? And then she told me, I think it's okay, but I think we have to inform the people of the pool, in, in charge of the pool, that they have HIV. I said to her, yeah, I believe what you're saying. I think it's only fair that we inform them as well. But then she also told me, but I'm just a little bit concerned because you see uh, a simple example of what happened to me. When I was swimming, my skin got exposed because of the the, the tiny little pimple the pimple thing got burst so my skin got exposed right and there of course you know how a pimple is right there's a bit of blood as well so just imagine if somebody else also was bleeding maybe they cut themselves or what and you know she's she's just thinking in that way so the blood and everything so she's just thinking so i was thinking it it makes sense what she's saying i i, I do not know whether it can transmit in that way i don't think it can la you know from what i've heard but you see a concern from a concerned society member. It's not it's not wrong for them to feel concerned. They do not know exactly what is the tiny little limit of how it can contract, right? So I don't think it can transfer through swimming pool. That's what I've heard. It cannot. But you see the concern of my friend, she also has a valid concern. So what I would do is I would ask permission from the person. And the person was not uh, so keen on that. So you see... It's a very thin line between what is okay, what's not okay. Even I do not know whether, oh gosh, I feel bad for those kids. You know, does that mean they can never go swimming? It's unfair to them as well. So I feel that society has good concerns, but at the same time, there needs to be a way that we can help them. We cannot just say to them, no, sorry, we don't allow. No, we can't just say that. So I think society is good to take precaution, but still, they need to be to have some kind of a way that we can be inclusive of all. You know, you can have your concerns, but how can you be inclusive as well? Like maybe after they come, you can clean the pool if you're really concerned also, you know. So now we can also imagine and put ourselves in their shoes. What it is like to have the virus as an adult. There is double stigma. First stigma, because they have the virus people are scared of them second stigma how did they contract it how did you actually contract it did you actually you know do something that was wrong you know did you deserve you know it's, it's very hurtful that that society actually asked them that question but you see the double stigma that they are faced with so to for, for society i would tell them please try to imagine what it would feel like if you were the one in their shoes having the virus as an adult they are faced with double stigma. Let's not make it harder than it already is in their life. And I would also tell society to be more aware of the nature of the virus so that they will avoid discrimination. I mean, before COVID-19 happened, I, I would hug them, the kids and everything. Nothing is going to happen through a hug. Nothing. So I feel the most important is, you know, you don't have you, to be aware, for society to be aware of how the virus can be transmitted and how it cannot be transmitted. And to be confident, to know that we don't have to be afraid of them and we don't have to stigmatize them. To, to educate ourselves also, not only about the virus, about the emotional difficulties faced by the, the kids and also the pe people. The emotional 
difficulty that they face, the behavioral difficulties that they face, because they face a lot of um, behavioral issues and emotional issues. So emotional meaning that they, they feel that they do not know how much time they have left. Behavioral is, um, you know, the, the virus does have some effects sometimes in their behavior as well. Emotionally, they feel really sad, like really excluded and really afraid to work. Because, you know, when you go for any job, right, you have to go for health checkup. And when you go for health checkup, whether your boss is now, now it's not about CGPA, it's not about only your transcript, your work experience. It's not only about that for them. It's also they pray that, okay, will they accept me? You know, will my boss accept me? Can you imagine if every boss turns them down because of the virus, what will happen to them? They need to work. They're very intelligent as well. So that is another issue, you know, for them, getting a job. So I think for society to be more educate themselves about that, that will really help them a lot. Okay. Uh, so uh, actually, I think for the A A I D S, they they is really uh, face many the challenging things uh, and really hard. So uh, what 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 kind of support uh, are you providing? Um, Providing to those with uh, uh, during the uh, uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, so also give us the advice how to face them uh, during the virus time. Okay, so the kind of support that I give them, I used to actually invite them to to UIA, and I used to have programs with them here. I would book a seminar room, and then I would have like programs how to motivate them, how to improve their emotions. Also, the programs are very much teaching them how to manage their emotions, how to be kind to each other, how to speak kindly, how to manage frustrations, and also like boy-girl relationships. Also, there was a lot of programs on, you know, because it was part of my, my intervention program, right? So behaviorally, some of them did not practice hygiene. So I was telling them about the importance of hygiene, also medication adherence, because some of them felt like, I just skip my medication, I don't care, you know? So giving them that, that kind of psychoeducation on that. And then also teaching them how to communicate effectively with their friends, how not to lose their temper and everything. So all of these things are programs that I was doing with them, but that was before COVID-19 happened. When COVID-19 happened, they couldn't come here. And also I couldn't really like go there as well. There was a lot of restrictions. So what I would do is I would keep in touch with the caregiver online. I would actually keep in touch with her um, online. So meaning to say that I will call the caregiver, I'll ask them, do you need any help? During COVID-19, I would also try to advertise about them and get them funding. So funding was, was given to them. They had a very bad time during MCO, you know, there were especially, they also got something called home-based families. Home-based families means that um, some of them who have HIV, but they have their own homes. So maybe they needed the care of the shelter homes in the beginning, but now they have their own jobs. They have their own homes. Now they even adopted some of those kids with HIV. So they, they call them the home-based program. There are about 10 families. 10 of the families huh, were having terrible, terrible um, financial issues. And so they would contact me and they would share with me about that. I would try to also ask for funding from who I know. And then I would try to like, give them the funding as well for the 10 families. And then there were some kids who went back to their families. They wanted to go back and be with their moms. And although the living condition was very sad actually, but they had already completed their study, so they wanted to go back. So that one, we needed to also take care of them. So I, I would say during COVID-19, in the beginning, money issue was a huge thing. After that, it was um, now, right? It's more emotional issue and physical and behavioral now. So now what I'm doing is I'm actually planning to have online sessions like this with them so that I can actually communicate with them and talk to them like this. So that is the upcoming program. I have been, you know, I've been postponing doing it because of so much of marking and classes and consultation, but I have to really schedule with them. So it's about time, honestly. I, I really thank you for this interview because this is a very good reminder. So the upcoming program is online support for youths in shelter homes for um, HIV AIDS. I also continuous financial assistance. I think I have to try to get some volunteers as well for that. 
I need to check up on them for that as well. So upcoming programs are these online support. The nice thing about online support is, I think it will be very easy for me to get all the kids from different homes to join in if they have access to internet. So that'll be really fun. I'm actually looking forward to that. Yeah. That is great. Yes. Um, we, you, as you said, even the, the smallest flu could be fatal. So um, as um, the COVID-19 is lethal, right? To them is, um, is a huge thing. So how, how does that affect them? Like we know that we are the people who are like have a strong immunity and it just scares us. How about them? Yeah, for them, they are afraid and they are concerned about it. And I think because they are still youths, right? You know how youths are, teenagers. They, they are afraid but I don't think they are as afraid as, <laughs> as adults, you know. They are like a bit more on the carefree side. The risk-taking behavior is a bit high. I would say the caregivers are more afraid even now. I would say they are very concerned. So they take a lot of good precautionary measures, which is a very good thing. They, I mean, of course, they really make sure that they, um, I, don't, I don't think they allow them to go out at all right now. They're very careful with that. So I think they really take very good, um, precautionary measures and they definitely are afraid but I would say because of their age right they probably are not as afraid as the adults I guess you know but they are concerned and physically aspect physically wise it's really dangerous for them honestly so I think that part they really need to take care so I think affecting them emotionally wise probably the thing that will be affecting them is that they don't get to go out as often that might be the one that's affecting them because the caregivers will be extra careful with them mm, yeah okay so um the present is kind of gloomy and not as bright as it is um as should be for people with hiv aids so what do you think the future looks like to for people like with HIV AIDS? i think right you know it was very sad that what happened in um uh, you know, like, for example, there was actually a lot of people who were trying to find out about a good cure for HIV. There were a lot of people who were actually trying to, to actually investigate about this, right? And do you remember the recent um, MH370? I think there was a scientist there that was doing that. That was very sad that the plane went down. I think he was actually, there were a few scientists there that were actually involved in that kind of research as well. So... I really believe that it's just like how they're coming up with the um, trying to find the medication for COVID-19. I believe the search and investigation for HIV AIDS also is still ongoing and people, are, they are still trying to find that. I really believe that there is a way that, that there, are, I really believe in the future, there will be some kind of a, um, a good and newly improved medication that would help them even better. Because now, there are different kinds of medication out there already. Do you know that even now, they can stop the virus transmission from mother to child in order for WHO to come up with 0% babies with HIV? They have that drug now to stop mother to child transmission. So if the, so the, when the mom is actually pregnant, right, they have to immediately take this drug. That is why a mother who has HIV can get pregnant. I mean, a lady who has HIV can get pregnant and they can take measures to avoid the virus from being transferred. So you see how it's, how advanced, thanks to God, that things have become. And I really believe that things can get better just like that as well. Slowly progression can be done. And I really am looking at hopefully more policy programs and more awareness being done to educate society so that society would, would really avoid this discrimination towards those with, you know, HIV. As, as how they are also looking at COVID-19 now to avoid the discrimination, you know, of PUIs and avoid the discrimination of people who have contracted it before. We do not have to discriminate. We just have to be careful, but we don't have to discriminate. So I think more educational awareness campaigns, starting from schools, I'm hoping that can happen, honestly. Yeah. Well, okay. I think we finished our interview questions. All right. Um, but the, you know, your answers are really interesting. So um, now we would let if um, our listeners have any questions 
few regarding our topic. Okay, sure. Siko and Sam, do you have any question? Ask uh, our professor. Uh, I have no question, but it's very nice, interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Siko. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, sometimes I invite them actually to UIA. So let's say when everything is okay and when things are better again, you know, with the pandemic situation, I I will try to I hope I can remember. I will try to let you guys know. Then if you ever want to come and meet them, you know, I always have programs during Eid, during Ramadan. We usually have programs. Actually, I miss that so much. Really, we used to have a program during Ramadan, and we have a thing called the Blessings Tree. You know, I drew out. This I still have it. It's under my bed because it's so huge. <laughs> it's a blessings tree. I drew it out. I, I use color paper and I stuck it on this big cardboard. And I have post-it notes in the shape of a beautiful, I think it was like a heart. Heart-shaped post-it notes I got from DIY. <laughs> so I would ask everybody in the Ramadan, um, you know, when we are when we're breaking fast, right? I would ask everyone mm -hmm. to write down um what they are thankful for and then during ramadan and they will stick on that tree and we call that the blessings tree so i miss that so much yeah so if ever i get a chance to meet them again i will call you guys as well. that would be great um yeah. there is no questions from our listeners but i'd like to ask a question since it's a really yeah. interesting topic um i myself had um a previous stigma towards people who have HIV AIDS, uh, mainly because of the environment um, and the ways that it was taught to us. It was kind of like, oh, is this, you know, lethal virus and everybody who carries it, it's just like a ticking bomb. You have to be worried about like around them and like, you're not supposed to share food or drink, you know, um, you have to li distance yourself from them. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately I had that, um, but through education and reading a lot about it and uh, listening to people who have it, you know, I came to the conclusion that it's just an, another unfortunate disease on earth, you know, and, you know, whoever has it doesn't mean that, you know, they deserve it because as you said, people think that you have it, you deserve it. And we all make mistakes. So it doesn't matter how big the mistake is. Nobody deserves to have, you know, a yeah. little condition like that. Yeah. Um, so do you think education, uh, especially when people are younger, could provide some sort of like um, an eye opening insight to people with HIV like, to be more empathetic and inclusive? Yes, I think that would really help a lot. You know, like some kind of a very good campaign, perhaps. You know, like how there's a lot of campaigns for frontliners and also people with COVID-19. So something to actually touch people's hearts, to know what they go through. A little bit like, you know, what to see a day in the life of someone with HIV. To really see through their eyes what they have to endure. I think that would be some a very touching campaign, you know, I think we need that to really help people have more awareness and maybe to teach that in school during the civics, civics class or something, during moral or something. I think we need to incorporate that in the, in the studies. How discrimination and then diseases, people who have um, gone in the wrong path, say, for example. So not just diseases, also, you know, behaviorally wise, anything. I think we need that so much in school, seriously. Okay, great. Uh, so, Alhamdulillah, uh, we already finished all the question, and uh, uh, really thank you, our doctor uh, give up, uh, give us the excellent speech. So, uh, I wanna see follow the prof um, follow the doctor uh, said uh, uh, AIDS is uh, uh, tr <clears throat> chronic uh, infectious. Uh, uh, the uh, this ice so need um, <clears throat> we need uh, the uh, medical spots and uh, spots and uh, uh, friend and uh, family care and uh, don't uh, don't uh, don't discrimination uh, against the ads uh, patent patents uh, so we can cross into the uh, our the doctors and our uh, the many uh, 
medical uh, we can talk in the re uh, reasonable Enable we to contact with them and uh, give them the care at the beginning of uh, the real people. They are right to the accept them is right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, alhamdulillah, and uh, really thank you again. Uh, our professor give us the excellent speech. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you for being compassionate human being and like oh, helping people you. who are going through so much right now and um we hope that whatever you're advocating for to help them and to make our societies better so inshallah i'm looking forward to many many sessions with you talking thank to you that you. was really, really interesting thank, thank you, you so much so again much. all the best to you thank you huda and also san uh bien and also seiko i really appreciate this it's been a really nice interview thank you so thank much you. Have a nice day, Miss. Thank you. You so too. Much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.